Okay, we have made it to the end of the book of Nehemiah, the 13th and final chapter of Nehemiah. And you're going to find out as we talk about it, there's a little difference in what's happening in this chapter. Nehemiah, as you know, has finished the project of building the walls in chapter 12, which we've talked about for the last couple of weeks. Um, He's dedicated the wall. They've had this time of rejoicing. And now we come to the 13th chapter. And if you go back and you put what you read in Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 2, with the middle part of the 13th chapter of Nehemiah, what you're going to find is that Nehemiah has left. And he left Jerusalem, and he's gone for 12 years. 12 years he's gone. And Nehemiah 13 is what happens when he comes back. Now, When you look at this chapter, it's a challenging chapter, and I'll tell you it's a rather discouraging chapter too because within that 12-year span of time, almost all of the reforms that Nehemiah had put in place, the things that had happened under his leadership, have fallen by the wayside by the time he gets back. And when he comes back, what he discovers is that the people have forgotten almost all of the things that they had committed themselves to do. And one of the ways that we see the difference, remember we talked about this a few weeks ago and you see the erosion of their commitment, is remember back in chapter 10, they had all signed this covenant that said they were going to do certain things from now on. And they were so serious about that that they signed their names to this commitment. And they said they would never cease to do the things that was in that covenant. But here we are, 12 years later, And the things that they had committed themselves to do, they've stopped doing. And so I want to cover the things that they've stopped doing. Four things, basically, that they violated in regard to their covenant. So let's jump right in. Here's the first thing that they did. They forgot their vows of separation. They forgot their vows of separation. Take a look at Nehemiah 13, verses 1 through 3. It says, On that day... They read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and in it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever come into the assembly of God, because they had not met the children of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. So it was when they had heard the law that they separated all the mixed multitude from Israel. And now I want you to watch what happens in these next couple of verses because I'm going to take you back in these next few verses to what happened on these 12 years that Nehemiah has been gone. And then I'm going to explain to you what took place. So continuing on with verse 4, it says, Now before this, Eliashib the priest, having authority over the storerooms of the house of our God, was allied with Tobiah. And he had prepared for him a large room where previously they'd stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles, the tithes of grain, the new wine and oil, which were commanded to be given to the Levites and singers and gatekeepers, and the offerings for the priests. But during all this, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Then after certain days I obtained leave from the king, and I came to Jerusalem and discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah in preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. Now, let me tell you what's happened in these 12 years. Nehemiah went away. He put all these reforms in place. They all signed the covenant. And so he went away, and while he was gone, the very people that he had entrusted to guard and to care for his ministry, the ministry there in Jerusalem, was not vigilant. And they allowed an awful, terrible thing to happen because the Bible says that Tobiah, if you remember from the first half of the book of Nehemiah, he was identified as one of the three major enemies of Nehemiah and therefore one of the three major enemies of God. And these enemies, when you read the first part of Nehemiah, they had come after Nehemiah. They would tried to destroy him. And Tobiah was one of those three individuals. 
And he, along with a man by the name of Sanballat, who we're going to talk about in a minute, and several other people back in the earlier part of the book, they had tried everything they could do to stop the rebuilding of the walls around Jerusalem 12 years earlier. And then the wall project was completed. And during that whole time, Tobiah had tried to infiltrate the work of God through a bunch of different ways. He'd tried it through conspiracy. He'd actually militarily attacked the children of Israel. And in every single instance, Nehemiah, under the direction of God, had been able to ward off all of these intrusions that this wicked man, Tobiah, had led. He'd even been involved in this scheme to try to assassinate Nehemiah. If you go back and read it, you'll find that Tobiah did some very evil things in the earlier part of this book. And when all of those efforts had failed and and Tobiah couldn't thwart the plans of God, I use that word because we've been playing a game at my house when we read the instructions, one of the words was to thwart your opponent. So I thought, man, I'm going to throw that word in today because that sounded cool. So anyway, he tried to thwart what Nehemiah was doing and he did everything he could to stop him and couldn't and he even tried to discredit him. And so he wrote letters to a bunch of people in Jerusalem who were sympathetic with his cause, and he wrote some letters to Nehemiah himself. And if you want to go find those letters, go back to Nehemiah chapter 6 and read verses 17, 18, and 19. So Tobiah had done all of these awful things. So can you imagine when Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem, the shock that he felt when he went back and he found that Eliashib, who was the high priest in Jerusalem, he'd made this special little room for Tobiah in the temple in Jerusalem. And so here was this man who had done everything he could to undercut the work of God. And when Nehemiah came back, after being gone for 12 years, he's out walking around the temple, and he comes and he says, hey, who's staying in this room? And they said, well, that's where Tobiah lives. I can imagine, Nehemiah's like, who? Who? Tobiah's living in this room because that, that's what he found. And so Tobiah, in some roundabout way, accomplished what he hadn't been able to do previously in this straightforward, frontal way. He'd finally infiltrated the people of God. And we find out as we study this, and I'm going to come back to this later, that Eliashib the priest had this marriage alliance with Tobiah. So Tobiah had come to Eliashib, they'd made some sort of an alliance, and they moved all of the furniture and all the other stuff out of the storeroom in the temple, and they moved Tobiah in. And so Tobiah had this little private apartment in the house of God. Now, let me tell you something about this. I mean, there is nothing that's more out of place than a heretic or a critic, or a person who's out to destroy the Word of God, like Tobiah was, there's nothing more out of perspective that you can imagine than for somebody like that to have his own little apartment right there in God's house. So when Nehemiah got back, he was mad. He was incensed about that, and so he immediately addressed the situation. So let me read to you what he did, starting in verse 7. Follow along with me in your Bibles. It says, And I came back to Jerusalem and discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah in preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God, and it grieved me bitterly. Therefore, I threw all of the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. Then I commanded them to cleanse the rooms, and I brought back into them the articles of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. So, Nehemiah comes back and he immediately demonstrates the courage to deal with these problems that he found there. He's been away for a while, but I'm telling you, he's the same old Nehemiah that we've been talking about for nine weeks now. And when he comes back and he finds out that Tobiah has moved into the temple and he acts like now he belongs there and he belongs to God and he's fraternizing with Eliashib, the high priest, he comes back. And it doesn't say in Nehemiah that he had a council with anybody. It doesn't say that he called a meeting. He didn't do anything like that. It says that he walked right up to that room where Tobiah was. And I can just picture this in my mind's eye, right? He walks right up to that room and he starts pitching furniture out of there as fast as he can possibly pitch it out of the room. Right out the door, the stuff went. 
And if you had been walking by that day, you would have wondered, what in the world is going on in the temple? Because Nehemiah was upset. And so finally, he gets the room emptied out of all of Tobias's, Tobias' furniture and where Tobiah was, we don't know. Um, hasn't appeared on the scene yet. Maybe Tobiah walked by, he was heading back to his apartment, and he saw his bed coming out the door, and he's like, I'm just going to keep on walking because Nehemiah's back. And I don't know exactly where Tobiah was, but what we do know for a fact is that they had taken a room that had been dedicated to the use for Jehovah God. They'd taken that room, and they used it for the purpose of a man whose job was to discredit God. And he discredited Nehemiah earlier. So when Nehemiah came back, he said, man, if we're going to use this room again for temple purposes, we've got to cleanse it and we've got to get it sanctified unto God. And that's exactly what he did. Now, it's an interesting start of the story. You know, when I read that, I think, you know, it's really not hard for us to imagine how that could happen. Because if we're not vigilant, folks, The same thing can happen to us. It should be a very strong reminder to us that no matter how frontal, how much in front our defenses are against the enemy, Satan never, ever gives up. If you go back and you read the earlier part of this book, you'll discover how tenacious Tobiah was until Nehemiah finally dealt with him. And then it looks like Nehemiah had won the war, Tobiah's gone, he's not mentioned again for several chapters and several years in the book of Nehemiah, but now 12 years later, he's back and he's doing it again, and so the things that he couldn't do outwardly earlier, he managed to do inwardly until Nehemiah comes back and this guy's living in the temple. Because they had forgotten their vows of separation. They'd forgotten those. Tobiah was an Ammonite. He was part of a group of people that God had commanded the people of Israel not to have any association with whatsoever because the Moabites and the Ammonites had refused to help Israel when they were coming out of slavery out of Egypt. And because of that, there was a curse placed on the Ammonite people. And God said, you're not to have anything to do with them. You're not to intermarry with them. You're not to have any fellowship with them. But here is a high priest, somebody who was one of the spiritual leaders in Israel who had made an alliance with one of the major enemies of God because they had forgotten their vows of separation. Here's what else happened. They also forgot their vows of support. They forgot their vows of support. Now, interesting relationship beginning at verse 10 that helps us understand something about the first nine verses. How is it? How is it that there was room in the temple for Tobiah to move in and set up his little residence, to set up his apartment? So let's go back to verse 5 and look look and see what that room was supposed to be used for. Verse 5 says, And he had prepared for him, Tobiah, a large room where previously they had stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles, the tithes of grain, the new wine and oil, which were commanded to be given to the Levites and singers and gatekeepers, and the offerings for the priests. So what in the world had happened to all of that stuff that was in that room before Tobiah moved in? And I'm glad you asked me that question because I'm going to give you the answer. It's right here, starting in verse 10. It says, I also realized that the portions for the Levites had not been given them. For each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to his field. So I contended with the rulers and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain and the new wine and the oil to the storehouse, and I appointed as treasurers over the storehouse Shelemiah the priest and Zadok the scribe, and of the Levites Pedaiah, and next to them was Hanan the son of Zachar, the son of Madaniah, for they were considered faithful, and their task was to distribute to their brethren. Remember me, O my God, concerning this, And do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for its services. So 
Nehemiah had come back after being gone for 12 years. He finds Tobiah living in the temple, kicks him out, and he gets all of the people together, and he says, you know what? This man would never have been able to move into that room if you people had been giving your tithes and your offerings, which was what was supposed to be stored in there. You stopped giving, and you opened up this vacuum, and when you open up a vacuum, the evil devil, Satan, moves in. And it's a great principle for all of us, right? Because when we look at our own lives, I mean, there's only so much space in our hearts, but when we go and we do the things that we're not supposed to do, when we start to compromise, we create this vacuum in our own lives and in our own hearts where God belongs. And when we do that, folks, it will not be long at all before Satan is going to be right in there taking up residence in your own life. And you start to compromise more and more and more. Some of you here at Grace, some of us, have walked with God. We used to honor the Lord with our life and with our substance and and with everything that we did. But some of us have backed off. And some of us have stopped serving the Lord the way that we did originally. And, And we've allowed compromise in certain areas of our lives. And all of a sudden... There is this vacuum created in your life, and now you wonder why it is that the enemy has such a strong hold on you in areas of sin and disobedience. It's because you gave him the opportunity to get a foothold in your life. And so these people, they had forgotten their vows of support. And what has happened is that they left the Levites with nobody to support them. Because remember, in the economy of Israel, the Levitical priesthood was supported by the tithes and the offerings of the people. And if you read the text carefully, what you're going to discover is that what has happened is the Levites, because nobody was given, they moved out. They moved out of the temple. They moved out of Jerusalem. They're back out in the suburbs. And they're just out there doing jobs, trying to fend for themselves. They started to harvest their own grain. And the question is, is if they're doing that, Who's taking care of the house of God? And the obvious answer is nobody. Nobody's taking care of the house of God. We've got Tobiah living in the temple. So nobody's taking care of those things. They had forgotten their vows of support. So Nehemiah reprimanded the officials for neglecting their responsibilities to make sure that the children of Israel obeyed the Lord in all of these matters of support. And what made it even more distressing for Nehemiah and so difficult to believe is just like I mentioned earlier, 12 years previously, they had signed this covenant that said they were not going to do this. And yet here they were 12 years later, and they'd done exactly what they said they were not going to do. The house of God's empty. The Levites are living out in suburbia, tilling their own ground, trying to work and take care of the things of God as best they could. But the house of the Lord is in disrepair because they'd forgotten their covenant. They'd made a vow that they hadn't kept. That's not really hard for any of us to understand, is it? Because we do the same things in our lives. And so, what does Nehemiah do? Well, he's going to correct the situation. So, here's his own words, verses 11 and 12. He says, So I contended with the rulers, and I said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together, and I set them in their place. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain and the new wine and the oil to the storehouse, because Nehemiah is back. And I want to tell you something. He's getting things in order quickly. He's got Tobiah out. He's got the tithes and the offerings coming back in. He's moving the Levites from suburbia back to Jerusalem. He's put them all in the right place, and they're doing again what God has called them to do, but he's not done yet because there's a third thing they had forgotten. They had also forgotten their vows of the Sabbath. They'd forgotten their vows of the Sabbath. Look at verse 15. It says, In those days I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. 
And I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. Men of Tyre dwelt there also, who brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. And let me remind you again, back in chapter 10, they'd all signed their name to the fact that they were not going to do exactly what was happening. Because remember, in the Old Testament, the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, Saturday, that day belonged to the Lord. And the Jews were under the law to observe it. And there were these very strict regulations about the Sabbath, and they weren't to violate any of those laws. But let me tell you what's really interesting about this. These Jews had just come out of 70 years of captivity. Remember that? 70 years they'd been in captivity in Babylon, and that was a reminder to them that they had violated the Sabbath laws in the first place, including the year of Jubilee, and they had violated these laws. Scripture tells you this. They had violated these laws for 490 years. 490 years. So in the Old Testament economy, God not only set up one out of every seven days to be given back to the Lord, but one out of every seven years was to be given back to the Lord. And then the year of Jubilee. And for 490 years, the Jews had violated the Sabbath year, the year of Jubilee. And so God said, all right, listen, if you won't give it to me like I asked for it, I'm going to take it from you. And so God took them to Babylon. He's the one that caused them to go into captivity. And he took 70 years out of their lives, which just happens to be exactly 490 years worth of missed Sabbath years. Take 490 and divide it by seven, once every seven years, and that is 70 years. And so for 70 years, they had been gone. And now they're back, hardly been back long enough for even one generation to come along. And the first thing they do is they start violating the very thing that had caused them to be in captivity in the first place. You know, I look at a story like that and my first reaction is I think, how in the world could they do something like that? Especially after being in captivity for 70 years. And then when I take another step back, I think, man, that is just like us, right? I mean, we're hard-headed, right? We want to do things our own way, and we never really finally learn anything. We know in our own hearts that God blesses us when we give. We know that God blesses us when we honor him. And yet the first time that we have any stress in our family or any stress in our financial dealings, the first thing that we want to do is we want to take God and we just want to set him on the shelf over here for a while while we go on with our business. And then we turn around and we wonder, why isn't God blessing me? What's going on? So I'll tell you, Nehemiah came back and he was ticked off. He, he was mad, and, and so he comes back, and he finds this evil man, Tobiah, living in the temple. He gets that taken care of. The next thing is he sees that people are doing all of these other crazy things, and he deals with that. And now he's discovered that they're violating the Sabbath after signing a covenant that says that they're not going to do it. And I want you to see what Nehemiah does about this. He says that there were actually men from another culture who have come and set up their wares in Jerusalem. And so these men of Tyre, according to verse 16, they'd moved into Jerusalem, they'd set up their business in the city, and the leaders of Jerusalem were allowing them to have their own little swap meet, or their own little flea market, or whatever you want to call it, right there in downtown Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And so Nehemiah faces this one head on, and I'll tell you, he gets after him in this. Verse 17, it says that I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, what evil thing is this that you do by which you profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers do thus and did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Or in other words, Nehemiah is telling them, don't you remember, folks, how we got here in the first place? Don't you remember how we got in the mess that we've been in? We did this before and God judged us. Yet it says at the end of verse 18, you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. 
So watch carefully what he does. Verse 19. It says, So it was at the gates of Jerusalem, as it began to be dark before the Sabbath, that I commanded the gates to be shut and charged that they must not be opened until after the Sabbath. And then I posted some of my own servants at the gates so that no burden would be brought in on the Sabbath day. Now the merchants and sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. So they got thrown out of the city, and so they're like, well, we'll just set up shop outside the walls. So it says, then I warned them, and I said to them, why do you spend the night around the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. That's what Nehemiah told him. And from that time on, they came no more on the Sabbath. Great, great story, right? I mean, I, I love Nehemiah, and I love the things that he does. And, and some people may look at this and say, is it right for him to have this anger and this zeal? And I'll tell you, it's absolutely right, because he's zealous for the holiness of God. It was right for him to throw Tobiah out, because he was God's enemy. He should have done that. And it's right for him to bring the priests and the Levites back and move them back in and tell the people to start supporting them because that's what God's word says that they should do. And it's right for him to throw all of the merchants out of the city and to lock the gates so nobody can get in or out on Sunday or Saturday. I was thinking about Sunday. I thought, oh, what if we locked the doors on Sunday and we just kept you guys here all day? But anyway, he spoke to the leaders and he shut the gates and he scared the merchants to death. And so they're gone. One more problem he's got to deal with. Last problem that Nehemiah noticed. They forgot the sanctity of their vows. They forgot the sanctity of their vows. If you come to the end of the chapter, you're going to see that they decided it was all right for them to intermarry, to marry other cultures. And so they'd started to marry wives from other cultures that was around them. Starts in verse 23. Look at what it says. It says, in those days, I also saw Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab, and half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and could not speak the language of Judah, but spoke according to the language of one or the other people. Now, the children of Israel had promised once again in writing, go back and look at chapter 10, verse 30, when you get a chance, they had covenant, put in that covenant, not to intermarry. And here we are 12 years later. They're not only intermarrying, man, they're intermarrying like crazy. You know, it's going on like it's going out of style. They've got wives from Ashdod. They've got wives from Moab. They've got wives from Ammon. And Nehemiah said that it was such a sad perspective because half of the kids that belonged to these Jewish parents couldn't even speak Hebrew. Some of them spoke the language of Ashdod. Some of them spoke the language of Moab, but they couldn't even speak the native tongue of the Jews. And God had commanded them to maintain their purity. Remember, these are God's chosen people. And out of the purity of the Jewish line was eventually where the Redeemer was going to come from. That's where Jesus was coming from. So they were God's chosen people. And without any leadership, to keep them from going astray. With Nehemiah gone, with his lieutenants left to keep track of things, they'd strayed quickly back into intermarriage. They looked around and said, man, these women are beautiful. And so they married them. And, and before they knew it, they had broken down the purity of the people of God. And I'll tell you, I think this probably frustrated Nehemiah more than all of the other sins. And the reason that I say that is because the actions he took were unprecedented in the leadership of Israel. He was so disturbed and so angry that he did something that I have never read any place else in Scripture. Verse 25, it says, So I contended with them and cursed them. Now, he didn't call them swear names. This means that he pronounced judgment on them. He cursed them according to what God had said about their sin. And then watch this. He struck some of them and pulled out their hair. He struck them and pulled out their hair. I mean, talk about a feisty leader. That's what Nehemiah was. Some commentators, when you read this passage of Scripture, it says that what he did was he struck them, and then he went up and he pulled their beards out. Pulled their beards out, which was one of the things they did when they were angry with each other. Now, I'll just, side note, 
That's why I'm clean shaven. You know, I don't want any of you getting angry with me and deciding you're going to pull my beard out. You know, so he was so angry, he went up to them and struck them and pulled out their beard or pulled out their hair. And then notice what else it says. And it says, And I made them swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons or yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations there was no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused even him to sin. So do you see that? I mean, God doesn't want them not to marry these women because he doesn't want them to enjoy the finer things of life. He doesn't want them to marry into the pagan cultures because he knows that when they do that, they will corrupt them. And so he uses as an illustration Solomon. God's chosen man, the man who built the temple, the number one son of David, the king of peace, the most beloved of God, and yet Solomon married foreign wives, and those wives corrupted even him. So all of the rest of you Jewish people, what makes you think that you're going to get by if Solomon couldn't get by? And so obviously, they had rationalized in their own minds that it was all right to marry women that they weren't supposed to. And I'll tell you, I mentioned this before, but the Bible is very clear that we are not to marry, if you're a Christian, you're not to marry unsaved people. The Bible still says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And yet I hear all the time Christian men and women making the decision to marry unbelievers and they've rationalized it in their own minds. They say, oh, I've prayed about it and God's given me peace about my decision. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. God will never, ever give his children peace to do anything that violates his word. You can call on God all you want to, but don't you ever blame God for your sinful behavior. If you're violating the word of God, it's because you're violating the word of God. You made the decision. Don't implicate God in it. That just makes it worse. And if you want to go marry somebody who's not saved, and you want to turn your back on what God says in his word, go do it. But don't turn around then and tell everybody that God said it was okay. I prayed about it, and he said it's okay, because his book says don't do it. It's very clear. But these people had just married with the Ashdodites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, and it had just become a mess quickly. Verse 27 says, Should we then hear of your doing all this great evil, transgressing against our God by marrying pagan women? And now watch this, because I mentioned this earlier. And one of the sons of Joyada, the son of Eliashib the high priest, was a son-in-law of Sanballat the Horonite. Now, let me just put that together for you. Remember, Eliashib was the high priest. He was the guy who brought Tobiah in and gave him an apartment in the temple. And it says that one of the sons, Joiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was a son-in-law of Sanballat the Horonite. Now, who was Sanballat? He was one of the three enemies at the beginning of Nehemiah. He's the one that had plagued Nehemiah along with Tobiah about trying to keep him from building the wall. But Tobiah gets involved in this alliance with Eliashib. And Eliashib's son has now married the daughter of Sanballat the Horonite. So he has married into the family of one of the number one enemies of Israel who had fought against Nehemiah. I mean, can you imagine what's going on here? Is it any wonder that Nehemiah was so upset? Here was Tobiah, who had tried to destroy him, slandered him all over the place, tried to keep the wall from being built. He's living in the temple. And then here's Sam Ballot. His daughter is married to the son of the priest. Notice verse 28. One of the sons, Joyada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was a son-in-law of Sam Ballot, the Horonite. So what did he do? Therefore, I drove him from me. I mean, I can just picture Nehemiah chasing that guy down the street. Get out of here. I don't want you anywhere around here. You're not welcome here in the temple. Get out of here, buddy. And I don't know exactly what happened, but I know Scripture says 
He got him out. He got him out. And then once again, he prays in verses 29 through 31 to close out the book. It says, Remember them, O my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Thus I cleanse them of everything pagan. I also assign duties to the priests and the Levites, each to his own service, and to bringing the wood offering and the first fruits at appointed times. Remember me, O my God, for good. I mean, you get the sense that Nehemiah is doing this in great courage and great strength, but also, I believe, with a very broken heart. And as he does it, he just keeps crying out to God, Oh God, oh God, remember me, don't forget me. I'm your man doing your work. If you forget to remember me, I'm all by myself standing for righteousness. Now, I know some of you are probably putting your Bibles away, but just like always, a couple of lessons I want us to get out of what this passage tells us. Two lessons, and then I'm going to be done. Here's the first thing that we need to learn. We need to be aware of the craftiness of the enemy. We need to be aware of the craftiness of the enemy. Satan, folks, he seeks to infiltrate, and he seeks to clutter up our lives all the time. He likes to come into the areas where God belongs in your life and to get all of God's stuff moved out so he can get his furniture moved in. I want to tell you a little story about a town in Northern Ireland by the name of Ballymena, a little Protestant town in Northern Ireland. Christian people there were very fond of holding these cottage prayer meetings. And on one occasion, a lady planned a series of three cottage prayer meetings to be held in her, room, her house weekly, one each week. Her next door neighbor happened to be one of the few Roman Catholics who lived in town, and she'd been witnessing to her, and she'd invited this young woman to come to one of her meetings, and she made an excuse and said she couldn't come. But the following morning after the first cottage prayer meeting, she was interested to find out what had happened at that meeting, and so the hostess, the Christian woman, said, oh, we had such a wonderful time. We had 35 people in my little home, and it was full. Why don't you come next week? Well, the next week came. The meeting was held again. She didn't come. The following morning, there was a similar conversation. She said, did you have a good time last night? And the, the Christian woman said, oh, yeah, we had a really good time, even better than last week. We had 51 people in my little cottage, and my cottage was full. There's going to be one more meeting next week. Would you come? Well, the third meeting came and went. Following day, the same question was asked across the garden wall because the woman didn't attend, and she said, did you have a good meeting last night? Oh, she said, wonderful meeting. In fact, it was the best yet. We had 62 people in my little cottage, absolutely full. And the Catholic woman looked at her, and she said, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's not possible. You began your meetings with 35 people, and you said your house was full. The next week, it was 51 and then last night it was 62. It can't be done. If your house was full with 35, how could you have 62? Oh, she said, very simple. Our little house was full when we had 35 in it. But you see, last night, we put all the furniture out on the lawn and made room for 62. And it's an interesting parable because the question we need to ask ourselves, folks, how much room is there in your life for the Holy Spirit and the things of God? Is the whole trouble with Tobiah and his furniture cluttering up the place the same trouble that's present in our lives? Have you let so much stuff grow up in your heart and in your life that you just don't have any room for God anymore? Too busy. No longer any room for Him to do His work. Or are you constantly taking stuff out to make more room for God? Are you constantly taking out some of the things that you've gotten used to and just put them out on the front lawn because you want God to be comfortable in your life? Because Satan's strategy, folks, very simple. His strategy is to infiltrate the apartment of your heart with his stuff until there's no room left at all for the things of God. We need to be aware of the craftiness of the enemy. And then second lesson, we have to be aggressive in confronting the enemy. We have to be aggressive in confronting him. Satan is very actively after us. 
The Bible says he's like a lion roaring and looking for us. And he takes some aggressive resistance to stop him. When you go back through this passage, I want you to notice how many action verbs there are when you look at Nehemiah's activity. Here's just a few of them. Verses 11, 17, and 25, it says he contended, which is very aggressive. Verses 9 and 19, he commanded. Verses 15 and 21, he testified. And then there's more intensive verbs. He cast forth in verse 8 when he threw the furniture out. Verse 25, he cursed, he smote, and he plucked. He attacked boldly and frontally, and there was no doubt in his mind. His actions were purposeful, and he dealt with these problems as soon as they came to his attention, and he did it aggressively. You know, we have a tendency when we get older physically, and believe me, I know I'm getting older physically. We have this tendency when we get older physically, and even as we get older as Christians, we have this tendency to just kind of settle in and to get complacent. And when these problems come along to just say, well, you know, maybe they'll just go away. You know, maybe if I just sort of hang loose, this thing will just float away. But I'll tell you, I continue to learn that problems just do not go away. If we don't advance on them, they advance on us. And while we need to be careful that we always have a godly spirit and a broken heart about things that are wrong, we can never, ever stand still when we see inroads being made against God's people, against the unity of God's people and the purpose of God's church. We have to adopt an approach just like Nehemiah. We have to be aggressive in confronting the enemy here in our church, most definitely in our culture, anything, folks, that crosses our path when we see the enemy advancing. One last little story, and then I'm done. Chuck Swindoll wrote a book on Nehemiah. I encourage you to read it sometime. But he includes in his book a little story about Ludwig von Beethoven, which you guys all knew who that is. Um, And so the gist of the story is that even though Beethoven was this very accomplished musician and composer, at a very early age, his life was starting to be checkered with all of this sporadic agony. And one of the things that was going on in Beethoven's life is he started losing his hearing. And as a matter of fact, by the time he was in his 50s, he'd come to the place where he couldn't hear anything. He was deaf, you know. And so, but he still continued to be this great composer. And so Chuck Swindoll finishes his story by telling about one day, Beethoven, frustrated, was seen in his house, down on his knees, pounding his fists on the floor, and saying this phrase. He's saying, I will take life by the throat. I'll take it by the throat. I will not quit. And the people that knew Beethoven said that even though he was deaf, he was still a magnificent musician. Even though he couldn't hear the music he had composed because of his determination to not give in, he was able to remain far more productive than he otherwise would have been because he took life by the throat. And let me just close by saying, You know, it seems to me that when it comes to the inroads of Satan in our lives and in our ministries and into the lives of our kids and our families, we need to be that aggressive. Nehemiah took life by the throat. And when problems came up, he went after them and he dealt with them. And that's why, as we close out this book, at least for a period of time here, sin has been taken away from the people, the temple's clean. The enemy's gone, and God's people are moving forward in unity to serve him. Let me just say, I mean, I hope that's our story here at Grace Baptist. No matter what the problems are, no matter what the obstacles, as Satan gets more aggressive and attacks in multiple ways, let us be a people who fight back even stronger. Today, as God's people in this age, it's time to stop watching It's time to stop giving any ground, not just to stand our ground. It's high time that we started fighting back. Look at what's going on in the society around us, right? We need to fight back to aggressively take this life by the throat with no more compromises. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, you've given us a great example and a great story with Nehemiah and the Jewish people. 
Help us to learn all of the things that we've talked about over the last eight weeks about leading holy and righteous lives, Lord. And just get a hold of us by the Holy Spirit and convict us of the things that we need to do so that we can live the lives you want us to live. And Lord, let us take the lessons from today and realize that there is no compromise with you. You want us to be completely obedient to you, completely in your will, walking with you every step of every day, Lord. And so help us to learn from Nehemiah to confront the enemy and to be aggressive and to no longer compromise in each of our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the things that you're doing and the things you're continuing to do in our lives individually and in the life of Grace Baptist Church. In Jesus' name, amen.